Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come, Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in 3 Nephi 12 through 16. Bryce, this is great stuff. It's it's the Nephite Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of the equivalent of that, isn't it? It is. And the most amazing thing about this sermon is it's as simple as a child's understanding, but it is deep and profound, and something really significant is going on here. And I'm so thrilled that this was preserved. So let's jump into kind of this difficult concept. What's Jesus really doing here? There are two steps in our progress to the celestial kingdom. Let me take you back to the Old Testament tabernacle. As you came out of the kind of the Gentile court, as you came out of the world, which kind of represents the celestial world, and then you come into the holy place. Now, it's the altar of sacrifice, and it was the little bowl where you were washed and anointed. And so kind of symbolizing the covenants of the gospel that allow you to come out of the world and into the terrestrial world. The holy place of the temple represented kind of the terrestrial kingdom, and that you've become a good person. You're honorable. And a lot of Latter-day Saints miss that, that the Lord uses the word honorable as a synonym for terrestrial in the Doctrine and Covenants, that terrestrial is honorable. It is good. These are good people. And so you've come out of the celestial and into the holy place, and there's phase one of our progress, is giving up the celestial and becoming a terrestrial person. The problem is that a lot of people seem to think that goodness is the goal, that being an honorable, good person is the goal, as if the goal is to go to the terrestrial kingdom. But there's a whole other kingdom And so once you've come out of the world through the covenants and you've become an honorable terrestrial person and you're in the holy place, the Lord now invites you to come into the next step, which is to let go of that which is terrestrial and become celestial. So if you go to the very beginning, now what we have in 3 Nephi is some missing verses that you don't get in Matthew's account, and that is the first preliminary steps and who this message was supposed to be given to. Notice in verse 1 of chapter 12, 3 Nephi 12, verse 1, right in the middle, he stretched forth his hands unto the multitude and cried unto them, saying, Blessed are ye if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve, whom I have chosen from among you, to minister unto you and to be your servants." So listen to the prophets. Come in out of the world. Listen to the message. Make the changes necessary to come out of the world. And then notice verse 2, last sentence. Blessed are they who shall believe in your words and come down into the depths of humility and be baptized, for they shall be visited with fire and with the Holy Ghost and shall receive a remission of their sins. So thou, all of a sudden, that sets the stage. The Sermon on the Mount are for baptized members of the church who have come in out of the world and are now being prepared to be taken to the next level. Baptism kind of assumes that we've given up some of those celestial sins. We've given up some of the things that would have prevented us from being baptized. So now Jesus is looking at good, honorable people and saying, there's one more step you need to make. This is great news, and this is bad news, because we're about to talk about all the terrestrial things that you need to let go of. If you're listening to this podcast, I'm assuming you have a desire to do what's right, that you're on the path to become a good person, that you've made covenants with the Lord, and that you follow the Holy Ghost. Well, now the bad news is the Lord says, okay, folks, you're partway there, but there's a lot of things you need to let go of in becoming a celestial person. The goal isn't the terrestrial kingdom. The goal is the celestial kingdom. And we need to let go of some things. So the Sermon on the Mount is going to focus in on what are some of the terrestrial things that you're still holding on to. Look at the progress you've made. Look at what I used to command, and you're obeying that. You've come so far, 
But now what are the changes you need to make in order to become celestial? So let me use an analogy. President Kimball, back in 1976, told a story about a group of researchers who went down to South America to capture some monkeys. They didn't want to harm them in any way, so a a snap trap that would snap on their leg wasn't going to work. They were too fragile for that, but they were way too intelligent for, you know, the bait trap where you put the banana under the box with the stick and the rope, and then you wait for them to take the banana and you pull the rope and then the box falls on top of them. By the way, that would totally get me. (laughs) They were way too smart. I'm always falling for the banana in the box trick. (laughs) They were way too smart for that. And so those researchers invented an ingenious way to capture these monkeys. They bored a hole into a tree or a hill or a box or something that was big enough for the monkey to get their hand in. And then they filled it full of nuts and fruits that they knew the monkey would like. So this is like the equivalent of clickbait, (laughs) basically. (laughs) Kind of. Yeah, you got it. So the idea here is once the monkey gets their hand inside the hole and then they make a fist holding onto the fruit, they can no longer pull their fist out. Now, the researchers would come out from hiding, and the monkeys would freak out, and they would jump and be hysterical. But guess what they wouldn't do? They wouldn't let go. So in that analogy, every single one of us has a telestial box, a terrestrial box, and a celestial box in our lives. And we all, let's admit it, we all have our hands in all of those boxes. I think there's always a telestial sin we're holding on to. That's what mortality is for. We're trying to overcome these. And we have our hand in that telestial box, and we're holding on to telestial fruit. And the Lord comes along and says, you got to let go. That box is destined to be pulled into the telestial kingdom. So either you let go of the fruit that's inside of it and let it go, leave it alone, and pull your hand out of that box— or you will be pulled with that box into the telestial kingdom. If you can't let go of telestial fruit, you will go to the telestial kingdom, so to speak. That's just my analogy. I know judgment is a lot more complicated than that, but bear with the analogy. And then I have a terrestrial box filled with all sorts of terrestrial fruits. And just as I think I'm making progress by letting go of the telestial fruit, I realize how many terrestrial fruits I'm holding on to. Well, along comes the Lord and says, you need to let go. You need to let go of these terrestrial things because this box is destined to be pulled into the terrestrial kingdom. So the Sermon on the Mount is primarily focused on What are the ter? Now that you've made some progress, you've come into the church, you're following the prophet's counsel, you've made covenants, you've been baptized, you have the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now that you've done that, what are some of the terrestrial fruits you need to let go of? Now, Mike's going to go through these a little bit more detailed, but let's just do a few examples. So go to 35, 12, verse 21 and 22. He says, hey, you've heard in olden times the original law, the law of Moses, or the law of coming into the church, so to speak, was don't commit violent crimes, don't kill. And I would suggest everything that goes along with that, Um, violence in any way, harming other people physically, don't hit people. We learned that in kindergarten, right? And Jesus says, okay, but you're holding on to some terrestrial fruits. You're not hitting people. But then he says in verse 22, whosoever is angry with his brother. And if you, if you call your brother names like Raka or poopy head or stupid or idiot, you're holding on to terrestrial fruit because there's something in your heart that you need to let go of. So f- harming my brother, hitting my brother, Killing my brother would be a telestial fruit that I've got to let go of. But sometimes I harbor in my heart anger and revenge that I don't act upon. Acting upon it would make me telestial. But holding that resentment in my heart is terrestrial fruit that I have to let go of. Grudges, bitterness, Anger in my heart, name-calling, thinking less of someone else 
I have to let that go. How much of that can we take to the celestial kingdom? We can't. I, I got to interject here. I, I know from firsthand experience, I, I was really mad at somebody for a long time. And I remember I was teaching about forgiveness and I just thought I am such a hypocrite because I haven't in my heart forgiven this person. I just begged Heavenly Father. I says, help me to get to that state. And it's a gift of the spirit. And when it happened in my heart, Bryce, I felt so free. It was like this massive weight was lifted. And so I want to just testify what you're talking about. It's like, he's not saying this to us because he wants to grind us into powder and, and be slaves. He's telling us this because he wants to free us, yes. right? Because Heavenly Father dwells in a state of never-ending happiness. His commandments are a way of being celestially happy and bring glory into your life. And aren't we glad that Heavenly Father doesn't hold grudges? Because, man, if he did, we'd be in trouble. And so he's asking us to be that kind of person. Look at Third Nephi twelve twenty-seven and 28. The big commandment is don't commit adultery. But then he says... But some of you are doing those things in your heart, in your minds. And technically, you're not committing adultery. Yes, you're, you're, you're doing good. But you're harboring those inappropriate feelings in your heart. And that is not celestial. You have to let go of the images in your head, the thoughts and the feelings in your heart. Bryce, this reminds me of that scripture that says in the celestial kingdom, we will see as we are seen, and we will know as we are known. In other words, it's preparatory to become, we're practicing celestial behavior, Exactly. So instead of looking upon a woman and lusting, you look upon people and see value and dignity and honor, because that's how celestial people are and view each other. So if that's the kind of person I want to be, then I need to be that person in my innermost thoughts, And so that's what these changes are all about. That's what Heavenly Father is doing. Just one more as an example. We know know this love your neighbor, hate your enemy. So it's kind of human nature. And we feel justified in, in hating the people that hate us. Have you noticed, Mike, in our society that everyone decries a hater? Everyone calls out a hater, but then they seem to be okay by hating the hater. It's so weird. So it's okay to hate someone who hates, but you're doing the same thing. And Jesus is saying that's a terrestrial attribute. Now, telestial people just hate everyone. They love themselves and hate everyone else. And there's this concept of a terrestrial person that says, look, you be good to the people who are good to you, and you hate the people that hate you. There seems to be this notion that retaliation is okay. That if you're mean to me, then I'm mean to you. That if if you do something against me on the freeway, then I'm justified in doing something mean to you. If you post something on social media that's offensive, then I'm, I'm okay in coming after you and trying to get you fired from your job. It's a terrestrial way of thinking, though. And we feel justified in doing it because justice demands it. But Jesus says that's not the celestial way. Celestial people do not return evil for evil. They return good for evil. Now, we can talk about justice and all of that, but the attitude here is if you do evil to me, I don't have to do evil back to you. Not outwardly and definitely not inwardly. Now, that in a nutshell is the transition of going from terrestrial to celestial. I remember as a young man, I was full of spit, fire, and justice. And the older I get, the more, and maybe in another 30 years, I'll get even more so. But I think there's something about wisdom and age, don't you? I get that we are naturally carnal people, but we are also naturally celestial people. There is inside of us a celestial memory beckoning to us. We lived in the presence of the most divine celestial people we can ever comprehend, And their memory has to be ingrained so deeply inside of us that it beckons us to wisdom and action. Just like the natural man beckons us to be angry and hate, there is something inside of us that beckons us to forgiveness and celestial attributes here. 
And so step one was to let go of the telestial. We should no longer be, you can't be violent and come into the church. You can't be an adulterer and come into the church. You can't be a hater and come into the church. And so coming into the church assumes that we've overcome a lot of our telestial desires. But now the question here is, are you on the path of letting go of the terrestrial things? And this is painful sometimes for people to realize who, who, you know, they look around and say, hey, I've become a good person. But goodness is not the goal. Celestialness is the goal. And so now we need to let go of all of these terrestrial. So now Mike, I, Mike's a genius at this because Mike can tell you that there's a lot more going on here. There really is deep doctrine and it really does tie to the temple. So let's go through each one of these, and then as we do, I'm going to pop in and say, do you see the terrestrial fruit he's asking us to let go of in this process of becoming like the greatest of celestial beings, our Heavenly Father? This is a journey of being in God's presence and like God, which means I have to let go of everything celestial and everything terrestrial along the way. All right, Mike. So... This is really important that I read this. This is right off of the church's website. We'll put it in the show notes. But there's an overview of the endowment. And it says, when you join the church, you receive two ordinances, baptism and confirmation. Likewise, the temple endowment is received in two parts. In the first part, you will privately and individually receive preliminary ordinances called the initiatory ordinances. Those ordinances include special blessings regarding your divine heritage and potential, and as part of them, you'll be authorized to wear the sacred temple garment. In the second part, you receive the remainder of your endowment in a group setting along with others who are attending the temple. And in it, the creation is told. The story of Adam and Eve, the fall, the atonement of Christ, the apostasy, the restoration, and so forth, and then you get instruction. In the course of the endowment, you make covenants. And on the church's website, it says, these are the specific covenants you make. You covenant uh, to obey the law of obedience, the law of sacrifice, the law of the gospel, the law of chastity, and the law of consecration. In return, God promises to bless us. And at the conclusion of the endowment, the participants symbolically return to the Lord's presence as they enter the celestial room. That is a like a two-minute overview of the endowment. Right, right off, off of the church's website. Yeah. That's not Mike talking. That's just we're reading from the church's website. I, I love how Elder Bednar said, it's as dangerous to not talk about the temple when we should as it is to talk too much about the temple when we shouldn't. Yeah, so the Nephite Sermon on the Mount, I think, is full of temple code. And my testimony is, The Book of Mormon is all about temple. It's all about coming home to Heavenly Father. And Jesus takes us there. This, and it's given to the disciples in the Greek text in Matthew, and it's given to the Nephites here. There's some minor distinctions. This is a temple text. It's an ascension text where the Lord's inviting people that have already left the the ocean of chaos, and they've come into the holy place where the saints are. And the Lord's like, okay, now we got some stuff to do. And this is all done ritually. And so in your mind's eye, just I want you to picture the tabernacle. And before you even get in it, you have the altar of sacrifice, and then you have the molten sea, or the laver as it's called. And then you enter into the holy place, and when you walk in, on your right is the bread of the present with wine, bread and wine, and think about the church and think about what we do on Sunday. And on the left is this menorah. And it's like this seven branch lampstand that has oil in it and there's light. And then you approach this altar before the veil and it's called the altar of incense. And in the book of Revelation, John says that that altar of incense and the smoke that's ascending to heaven represents the prayer of the saints. And then there's a veil. And on the other side of it is the the oracle or the the holy of holies as it's the called. The symbol of God's presence. Kodesh Hadak. Kodeshim, the the holy of yeah the God's presence, the throne of God, and the ark is sitting in the temple period uh, on a stone, the foundation stone, and there's a lot of evidence that the ark was actually carved. They carved a niche in the foundation stone so that the ark was actually a little bit lower. It represented the footstool of God, that God would literally rest His feet on the ark and establish His feet and His throne, and that God would rule on earth as he rules in the heavens. And this is all an invitation to us to come back to God's presence. And so 
In I the, want to point out yeah. that the destination is to get to that stone. That's where we're going. We're going to end up at that stone. So think about the Sermon on the Mount and how it ends, because we're going to end up in God's presence at the stone. If you've given up all the terrestrial things and come into his presence, you will end up at the stone. It's like Helaman 5.12. Remember, remember, we want to be established on that rock, which is Christ. Helaman 5 is all about the temple, and so is this sermon. And so it begins with, blessed are ye if you give heed to these who I have chosen. That's verse 1. Or blessed are they who believe in your words. More blessed will they be. And then verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are all the, they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. First, I want to talk about that word, blessed. And the word in the Greek is makarios. And to me, this is important because that word, some Bible translators don't like the word blessed, and they've translated it as fortunate. Uh, a couple translators, uh, W.F. Albright and C.S. Mann, they're distinguished biblical scholars, they've translated it this way. This is their translation of the text. Fortunate are the humble in spirit. Fortunate are the meek. Fortunate are those that hunger and thirst. And then if you go into their footnotes, they explain why. They say that the word fortunate works better for them because the word makarios, which is the Greek word, represents to them a state that the gods are in. Makarios was the state that beings in the heavens were in. And to these translators, they're like, well, we can't really go with that because Jesus is talking to mortals. And in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, if you look up Makarios, the very first definition they give is that this is the state of those that are gods. They are Makarios. They are blessed. So as a Latter-day Saint, you know, the bell starts ringing and I'm like, okay, Jesus is inviting us to do something different. Now, the distinction kind of softens over time and those that were Makarios became the uber elites or the uber wealthy. And notice what Jesus is doing here in the passages. Like, look at verse 4 of 3512, where it says, Blessed are all they that mourn. Or verse 6, Blessed are all they that hunger and thirst. The word all is not in the Matthew text. That's a subtle thing, but here's what I think is going on. I think Jesus is inviting all of us to enter into the blessed state of the gods. All of us. Everybody. Now, every one of these Beatitudes is attached to a psalm in the Old Testament, and it has to do with coming into God's presence. Notice there, and they're all about letting go and recognizing I need help. So, blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, who say, I need thee, Lord. I need thee every day. I need, I, I need help. Um, blessed are they that mourn, and I love those that mourn for their sins and those that mourn. For, I want to be a better person. Blessed are they who are meek, who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness. Notice it's that celestial attribute. They're letting go of the world. They're letting go of tra- – there's always that element of something that they're letting go of to be a better person, and they're longing to be a better person. Let's talk about the meek. So go with me in your scriptures to the 37th Psalm. Verse 11, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I think Jesus is referring to these Psalms. These Psalms were used in the first Israelite temple to prepare the people to make covenants to enter into God's presence. And the king and queen would ritually make these covenants in the, in the sight of all the people at the temple. And then the people would be under covenant and the person who would officiate in this drama would say to the people, as the king and queen have made this covenant, do you make the covenant? And they would do so. And as they did, then justice and truth and equity would reign in the house of Israel. Go to the 25th Psalm. Look at verse 9. This is the promise. And here's a quick review. Verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment. Now, judgment is a word. It's a temple word, and it has to do with sacral kingship. The king on earth, if he was righteous, would judge according to true judgments. Now, that's that's a key word, and we're going to talk about that later, because that's kind of come up right at the end when we're getting, getting to the throne. And that's a quality of priesthood and sacral kingship. And the meek, he will teach his way. 
Now, that's another code word. The way is a code word for how we get to the top of the mountain. The Greek is hodos. And if you're a Star Wars fan, I got to throw this out there. It is the way, right? That's a big deal. Uh, The way is how we get there. Verse 10, all the paths, we're back to that code word of the way, of the Lord are merciful and truth or mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenants. For thy name's sake, the covenant's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed, eternal increase, shall inherit the earth. And then verse 14, the secret of the Lord. Now that word secret is sowed. Those who have entered into the council. The sowed is a, another code word, and it means to enter into the council. My testimony is on Joseph Smith's experience in the first vision when he was 14, God pulled him into his council. And the first vision is an endowment. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. That is the sowed covenant, the one made at the council in heaven before we ever came to earth. And so on that word meek, there's so much. But when Jesus says the meek are going to inherit the earth, to me, you got to read Psalm 37, you got to read Psalm 25. And what are we talking about? Sacral kingship, endless seed, the pre-earth councils, and getting on the way, or the which, path. Which also brings up one of the major terrestrial fruits he's asking us to let go of. You've got to let go of your pride. You cannot come into the presence of the Father with pride. And so he keeps emphasizing these celestial attributes and these celestial words. And every time he seems to be implying that we let go of a terrestrial fruit. So if I'm supposed to be meek, well, who's not meek? The proud are not meek. So he's saying, let go of your pride, and then you can inherit. It's, it's always that let go of the terrestrial fruit here. So there's another terrestrial fruit, pride. We got to do hunger and thirst, right? We got to do that one. So that's verse six. Blessed are all they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. A great cross reference with this is Alma 32, 40 through 43. Now, Bryce and I talked about it on the Alma 32 podcast. So what I want to just draw your attention to is that last part of verse 43 that Bryce illustrated so brilliantly. If you water the tree, and the tree is a huge celestial symbol, the tree in the first Israelite temple was in the Holy of Holies. John's going to put it back. If you read the book of Revelation, in the Holy of Holies next to the throne is the tree. If you know the story of the creation, there were two trees. And to me, trees, and Isaiah is going to do this when we get to Isaiah, trees represent lots of stuff. One of the things they represent are people or divine beings. And so the tree's there. But remember what we talked about in our podcast with Alma 32. If I water my tree, what eventually happens? The tree waters you. The tree feeds you. Yes. Now, the problem is, think back to Lehi's dream, there's an imitation happiness. If you pursue the wrong tree, if you go to the building instead of the tree of life, there is no filling. You can't be filled. And so, again, if you let go of terrestrial things that you think will make you happy, guess what? They're not going to fill your soul. I love this verse in 2 Nephi chapter 27, verse 3. And those that fight against Zion and distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. Yea, it shall be unto them even as a hungry man which dreameth. And behold, he eateth and awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or a thirsty man which dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh and his soul is faint. In other words, telestial and terrestrial things are like being hungry and dreaming that you eat. But someday you're going to wake up and realize that my soul is not filled. So the promise is if you will come to the celestial side, if you will let go of the imitation, it will fill your soul. That's what Jesus told the the Samaritan woman. If you drink of this water, meaning all the world's water, all the things that this world offers, you will thirst again. But if you drink of celestial water, If you eat of the fruit of the tree of life, it will fill you. It will fill that hunger inside you. Do you remember when we did 1 Nephi 8 and the descriptions of the fruit? There are eight of them. And every time it's a superlative, meaning that the love of God, the love that God is offering you and the things of the celestial kingdom are sweet above all that is sweet. 
white above all that is white. They are the most pure, the most delicious, will bring you the most joy. They are the greatest things of earth. But don't be fooled by an imitation. Let go of the imitations. They will never fill your soul like the celestial things do. So right here in the Beatitudes, we find the Lord saying, Blessed, celestial are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, because that pursuit will fill your soul. Now, I got to tie that with verse one, and it's about two thirds of the way down. But after we're baptized with water, Jesus says, and I love this, he says, I will baptize you with fire. That's being filled with the Holy Ghost. And it's Jesus doing it. And if you think about this, you can think, you know, you could fool somebody and get an ordinance because, you know, we're mortals, but you can't fool Jesus. He fills us. And it's not that we're perfect, but it's that we're on the way. We're on the path and we're trying and he fills us. And I love that. I got to read this. Jesus is quoting the Psalms again. These Psalms are related to first Israelite temple and they're all out of order because of the Jewish apostasy in the seventh century, but the text is still there. So go with me to the 63rd Psalm and look what it talks about being hungry and, and being filled. Verse one, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. That's where we are today to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. We're at the temple. This is about coming into God and seeing the arm of God. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus I will bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. That was a prayer stance in the Old Testament to pray with uplifted hands. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed, I will meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Now think about the ark. On top of the ark of the covenant, this mercy seat, the wings. You're in within the holy of holies. And by the way, another idea that is related to being in the shadow of the wings is to be in the sacred embrace of the Father. My soul followeth hard after thee. My right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go down into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. Verse 11. But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. To me, this is a temple text, and it's about coming into God, being filled. And I loved about two-thirds of the way through verse 1 where it says, I'm going to baptize you. And then in the end of verse 6, Jesus says, you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And then watch back in 3 Nephi, when he comes, watch how often that word is used. Watch for it in 19, watch for it in 3 Nephi 20, because Jesus is going to fill them. And that's a literal, but it's also a pointing to a symbolic, that if you will come unto Christ, and again, let go of the terrestrial, let go of the celestial, and come unto Christ, you will be filled. Okay, one more on the being filled. There were a number of early Christian sources that looked at the cross of Jesus as the tree of life. And to many early Christians, the Savior's body was the fruit of that tree, and his blood was the waters of life. And in the Gospel of Philip, it says that the cross was made of olive wood. Think about section 88, where you know we talk about the olive tree being the tree of life. Now, I'm fine with whatever the tree of life was. But these early Christian traditions, looking at the body and blood of Jesus as the fruit of the tree, I think that's all connected in there. I want to talk about verse 4. All they that mourn will be comforted. Sometimes when we talk about comfort, we think about like a blanket. I don't think that's what it meant. I think this is an invitation that as we mourn, as we're meek, as we thirst after righteousness— God is going to give us comfort, and the comfort is empowerment. Now, the word in the Hebrew is neham, and it's related to a lot of other words in the Old Testament and in the Book of Mormon, but comfort, it's a deep emotional identification, and it talks about this idea of giving strength or power, and so it does kind of add some more meat to the bones. If we look at the word comfort, in the context of the Psalms. So go to the 23rd Psalm. This is a really famous one. 
So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Those are symbols of kingship. And the comfort is empowerment. In other words, in the midst of the shadow of death, God is saying, well, he said this to Nephi, and he said this to Joseph Smith, and he said this to Alma, I know it's hard, but I've already set your table. You have kingship in my, in my kingdom. You are a divine son of God. And the rod and the staff was a symbol for this. And the ceremony was the feast. At the end, look at verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's kingship. My cup runneth over. The individual writing this psalm is talking about the temple, right? The Lord's going to bring us in past the waters, past the valley of shadow of death. He's going to be anointed. He's going to be given a staff, and he's going to be given comfort. That word has to do with empowerment and being part of God's kingdom, part of his family, to become a son of God. You'll see this a lot in modern scriptures. Remember when Alma the Elder is over at the Waters of Mormon, and here comes Amulon, and they put tasks upon them, and they make their lives miserable. The Lord comes in and says, look, I'm going to strengthen your backs, that you cannot feel this. And then probably my favorite example is when the Lord says to the brother of Jared, I give unto men weakness, that they may be humble. Now, isn't that the number one reason that celestial people mourn, is because of weakness? and sin, not only ours, but the people we love. Isn't that why we really cry at the celestial level? It's because I've sinned, we've sinned, or someone I love has sinned. And so I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. Now watch what he does. If my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me, for if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, here comes the comfort. Then will I make weak things become strong unto them. That's the celestial gift. If you really do mourn over your weaknesses and the weaknesses of others, and you turn to Christ and come to God, which this whole process is trying to lead us to, then will he, we become him, and we gain his strength, and then will weak things become strong. That's that whole process of, of comfort. I really like the idea of just asking for it. I'm on the path. I'm trying. I think sometimes in my mind, Bryce, I try to just do it by my sheer willpower, and every time I fail, and I think that's by design. Which goes back to that first beatitude, blessed are they that are poor in spirit and come unto me. You just described that very picture. It's the person who says, I can't do it without the Lord's help. I need his help in my life. I need his grace. And so we come unto him, we cry out to him, we mourn over our sins, we hunger and thirst after righteousness. You see that whole pattern of what this image is trying to lead us to? That's so good. Okay, we're going to do one more beatitude, and it's the verse 9. Blessed are all the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I think, once again, we're talking Old Testament stuff. So go to Isaiah 52, and we're going to talk about publishing peace. Isaiah 52, I think, is full of temple code. Look at verse. Oh, there's so much. I have to do verse one. Okay, here we go. We have to do verse one first. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. This is used in a liturgical context or a ritual context where the people were making covenants and God said, get out of the dust. This is Lehi talking to his sons. Arise and then make these covenants and then sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. We're leaving. We're leaving the telestial box. Get your hand out of the terrestrial and telestial box. Yeah. Verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that publisheth or that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up a voice, and with the voice together they will sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. In the first Israelite temple, they would sing. There was a lot of singing in this temple drama. And if you're seeing eye to eye... You're in a circle, and you're talking to God, and you're singing. Break forth into joy and sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. So 
They're in a circle. They're singing to God. They have joy. And then verse 10, why are they doing this? Why? Well, the Lord is going to make bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. The Lord is going to be manifest. And the Nephites are literally living this. They are seeing God. So this idea of being called the children of God in verse 9 of 3 Nephi 12 is to be in the family. Well, if you're in the family, you see the Father. And so he says that. And then he, he says, says in verse 11, Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing. There it is. So there's the journey to the celestial city. There's the journey to the celestial way of life. Come be in the family. But you've got to let go of everything that's holding you back. You've got to let go of everything that you're holding on to that's keeping you out of the celestial city and the Father's presence. We ought to just go, jump to verse 11. When men revile you and persecute you. And say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Don't return it. It's that same idea we talked about. And this is happening all over our world today. We are being reviled and persecuted. And people are saying all manner of evil against us. Anytime you stand up for anything that's right, you have to face the vile and the persecution and the reviling. And Jesus says, look, don't return it. It's a sport right now. It is. You, you don't need to hate the people that hate. You don't revile the people that revile you. You don't return it. That's not what celestial people do. We return good for evil. Yeah, so good. So that's just in a nutshell some of the context of the Beatitudes from a ritual perspective. There is so much happening in the Greek I'm going to read 3 Nephi 12. Look at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So in the Greek of Matthew 5, 3, the word for heaven is actually the genitive plural, heavens. And just to have some fun sometime and just type in Google, type in Book of Mormon PDF, pull up a PDF of the Book of Mormon. It's so fun to do word searches. Bryce, I know you do this. Type in the word heavens plural, with an S at the end of it. And there's over 30 references, and it's not just Isaiah. There's like six or eight of them from Isaiah. But the Book of Mormon throws this idea out, of this idea of heavens. Now, you don't have to believe this. I'm a text nerd. Outside of the Bible, there's this whole tradition in the Enoch literature of levels of heaven, that there's multiple heavens, and that the Father is in the highest heaven. And as a Latter-day Saint, this shouldn't trip you up too much if you've you know read section 76 and those ideas. And, and so in the Greek... It's the poor in spirit are going to inherit the heavens, plural. Now, I'm okay with leaving it out because, you know, it's a text that we're giving to 19th century Protestants that are coming unto Christ and heaven, heavens, potato, potato. But I just had to say that. Like, anyway, languages are fun. Hence, Paul says he was taken up to the third heaven. Yeah, yeah. So there's more than one. There's something going on. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Anyway, for what it's worth. So after the Beatitudes, there's this stuff about salt and light and If you just cook meat on the altar of sacrifice and there's no salt, it kind of smells like burning flesh. And so what they were told to do, the priest would cut up the animal and wash it, and they would heavily salt it because it made a sweet savor. And that represented to God like their work and their sacrifice. And so as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to be thinking once again of the structure of the tabernacle. It's a physical representation of everything we're talking about. So first you come in and then you put your sacrifice on the altar. And if you think about this, like in an application setting, if my salt isn't pure, it kind of stinks. And if you think about that as Latter-day Saints, if we're too much like the world and the impurities are too bad, it's kind of like that story with Corianton, right? Where he's like, you can't preach the gospel, Corianton, because your salt's messed up. You're not doing it right. And so from there, we go to this covenant of obedience. Look at verse 19 and 20 of 3 Nephi 12. So we have the sacrifice, and then we have this covenant of obedience. Keep my commandments, it says in verse 20. You have the commandments before you, and the law is fulfilled, verse 19. And then he says this. In verse 23, it doesn't read like it reads in Matthew. In verse 23 of 3 Nephi, it says, If you shall come to me or shall desire to come to me, then get reconciled with your brother. In the Matthew narrative, it talks about this idea of bringing your gift to the altar. And so I think the invitation is, as we come to Christ, if there's any unkind feelings that I have towards my brother, before I bring my gift to the altar or before I come to Jesus, whether you're reading Matthew or or the third Nephi narrative, I've got to to be reconciled, reconcilio, to sit again with. I've got to be able to sit with my brother 
so that Jesus can receive me. So there's that invitation of just not having those hard feelings. And then in 3 Nephi 12, 27 through 32, it's about chastity. Yep. And not just outward chastity, it's inward it's chastity. Heart. You know, those of you who obey the law of chastity on the outside, well, do you obey the law of chastity on the inside? Is that something you need to work on? The Lord is inviting members of the church to say, are you obedient to the law of chastity as inwardly as you are outwardly? Or do you allow yourself to lust? Do you allow you to, I mean, is pornography an issue? Because how much pornography can you take into the celestial kingdom? How much of that That's attitude, a great question. How much of that weakness can you take into the celestial kingdom? You've got to let go of that inner lust. You shouldn't even be seeing people that way. That's not how celestial people look at people. Celestial people see something else. And so, again, this is more than just a don't commit adultery. This is a you need to circumcise your heart. If any part of your heart is committing adultery, that's what needs to change. You've got to get your hand out of that box and come to God. I think ritually we're right in the holy place now. I can't read this sermon and not examine my life. And all of us have things in our life where we say, oh, I don't like this about myself. And so if you're listening right now and you're thinking about, okay, there's things in my life, oh, I don't like that about my life. I think to me... It's the Savior saying, okay, Mike, when are you going to start? Are you going to wait till you're in 10 years? When are you going to do this? Because now is the time to do it. So I think this is a sermon, whatever spiritual level you're at, it's just an invitation to change. And that's the brilliance of this sermon. Children can read this sermon and understand it, and they can see in their lives what they need to change. And yet the most spiritually enlightened person can read this sermon and see things in it that they need to change, because this is an invitation for all of us to move to the next level. Yeah. So be chaste. So we've talked about obedience and, and our feelings and sacrifice, and then to be chaste. And then in the 12th chapter, 33 through 37, Jesus talks about how we make oaths. And he essentially says, you don't have to be really fancy about it. It's it's yes or no when you communicate. Verse 37, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. And whatever cometh of more than this is evil. And I think one of the things that means, Mike, is what does it take for you to keep your promises? Telestial people don't keep their promises. Terrestrial people keep their promises if you get them to sign and swear with an oath. Do you remember closing your house? Yeah. Signing 19,000 documents? So I'll give you a car as long as you sign this piece of paper promising, making it legally binding that you pay for it. But what does a celestial person need to do in order to keep their oath? Simply say that they're going just say yay, yay, or nay, nay. Because if a celestial person says they're going to do it, that's all you need. You don't need them to sign a document because they're going to do it. Like where Nephi, where Laman and Lemuel say, let's go home. We're not going to get these plates. And Nephi says, you know what? I'm not going to quit. We either get these plates or we die trying. Because that's kind of the attitude of a celestial person. And the next one is kind of eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. Telestial people just go around poking out eyes and taking teeth. <laughs> They're the aggressors. They're the mean person who just steals. Terrestrial people kind of say, well, I won't be mean to you unless you're mean to me. Terrestrial people will take a tooth if you took mine. Poke out an eye if you poked out mine. And again, Jesus says that's terrestrial. You got to let go of that revenge, getting even. You got to pull your hand out of that box because celestial people do not return evil for evil. Bryce, it reminds me of that story President Packer told about the guy whose wife died giving birth, remember? And he just harbored these ill yeah, feelings. Yeah, the, the doctor brought a disease, and she died yeah. of the very thing that the doctor was treating in the previous And house. he just hated that doctor. And you remember what President Packer said? Well, he went to the stake president, and the stake president said, leave it alone. Let it go. Let it go, bro. Just let it go. You hating him is not going to do anything. And then all of a sudden he began to see a overworked, underpaid doctor trying to do his very best to save lives who came in in a crisis and helped. And then all of a sudden he let it go. He let go of that revenge and he stopped demanding a tooth for a tooth. He let it go. We're getting closer to the to the veil, as it were, in the ancient temple. So at the end, in verse 48, 
Jesus invites us to be perfect. There's a distinction between the Greek New Testament and the Book of Mormon. When Jesus is in Matthew, he still is inheriting this flesh that has is subject to mortality, right? He sweats, he bleeds, and those things. And so he says, be perfect or be finished, teleos, as my father is. Through Nephi, he says, be perfect even as I. And because he's a resurrected being, they're standing in front of a God who's resurrected. He's got this glorified body. And so he says, be perfect even as I. And I think that distinction is important. I, I want to just reiterate this. We believe in a God who is human. Jesus Christ is a human being. And his father is a human being. And as Latter-day Saints, we stand in a unique position to testify that Jesus is the son of his father. And they're like us. And I, I think sometimes Which we don't realize we how we can that become is. like them. Yes. I mean, we can be the whole destiny. The whole reason for everything he's done on this earth is to hand us everything that they have. And say, we can become like they are. So there's the destination at the end of this road. And we're, I mean, here's Jesus at the very end of the road. And he sees us struggling along the path. And he's cheering us on, saying, come on, you can do it. I'm at the end. I made it. I'm at the end. I started where you started. I went down the same path. And I made it. So you can make it too. Don't give up. Keep going. Get your hand out of that box. (laughs) One day at a time, you're going to make it. Can you imagine someone from the first century that had maybe a jade necklace or they had some really cool piece of cloth that they wore that kind of separated from their neighbors. They thought they were so cool. If you transplanted them here where we have things like smartphones and jet planes and (laughs) and yet as silly as that is to a celestial being, the coolest jet plane here is lame, right? (laughs) Come, you have no idea what's ahead. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God hath for those that love him. So we're getting closer. So in the 13th chapter, from a ritual perspective, we've got to go and get into God's presence. And President Packer says this so many times where he says, the way we get revelation is through prayer. And so in the 13th chapter, in the first essentially 19 verses— is Jesus talking to them about prayer. Notice interesting stuff. Look at verse three, where he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And then he uses this phrase that your alms may be in secret. In the Greek text, it's krypto, which is hidden or concealed. So we're talking about hidden prayer or secret prayer. To me, this is all a temple text, but it's like Bryce said, so plain, like a six-year-old could read this stuff. Now, so, the oh, yeah. thing I love about chapter 13 is we, we've dropped the telestial off. There's no mention of telestial anymore. So we've come out of the telestial. We're now in the holy place, and now we've got celestial and terrestrial left. So now we've got to say, how do I get out of the terrestrial? So chapter 13 is all about the difference between celestial and terrestrial. And both of them do good. Terrestrial people do good. Celestial people do good. The difference is terrestrial people do good for the wrong reasons. And so if you notice in this chapter, it's not just prayer. It's prayer for the right reason. It's fasting for the right reason. It's money for the right reason. It's doing good things for the right reason. So now he's trying to say, okay, all of you that have made it this far in the journey are doing good. But you need to learn to do good for the right reason. So do you pray so that everyone else can see you pray? Is that why you pray? Is that, do you look forward to prayers so that you can show off your spirituality? And if you bring that into our world, why do you do good? When you go on a mission, do you stand up in front of everyone and say, look at what I'm willing to do. Can you believe what I'm willing to do for God? Or we give our spiritual resume. <laughs> and we just simply just point out, I'm doing good, and you need to recognize it, and you need to give me credit. Well, if that's your goal, you just lost the celestialness of it. And you're holding on to terrestrial fruit because you're doing good to be recognized of other people. It's such a challenge because we live in a world of instant social media and it's so challenging and I don't know how to totally navigate this. Sometimes I even think about doing a podcast. Am I being that guy? Right. right? And it's just a, it's that con- because he said in the previous chapter, let your light so shine. Let people see your good works so that they glorify God. But there's a, such a delicate balance there between doing your good works so that they see you. If your desire 
If your heartfelt desire is for credit and recognition, you're holding on to a terrestrial fruit. I don't know who said it, but somebody wise once said praise can be poison. Yes. I love how C.S. Lewis described this painter who had kind of lost track, and he just says this beautiful phrase, you know, on earth, sometimes the snare of ink and performance and the praise of the audience causes us to forget the love of the thing we tell and fall in love with the telling. And that's where we cross the line. I need you to give me credit. He brings up fasting. It's so funny. Fasting is such an interesting thing. and <laughs> It's almost like any time you fast, it's like you need to tell people. Yes, I'm fasting now. I'm fasting. Well, why did you need to tell me? <laughs> yeah. I didn't need to know that you were fasting, but it's just like we can't <laughs> resist. Yeah. Or um, I do that too with sugar. Like if I go six weeks without sugar, hey, I have to let everyone know. Right. I'm, I have I'm to tell everyone. Sugar. And I'm like, why do I tell people that? And I know this is human nature, and I, I know we need to be careful with this. But you get the idea. Celestial people don't draw attention to themselves. Celestial people don't do good things so that everyone else can notice them. I. But then the challenge is you do good things and people notice. So it's this constant battle. And we want them to notice our good things so that we inspire them. Right. And there's the balance. Letting your light so shine before man that they glorify your father, but not letting your light so shine before man that they glorify you or that you seek their glory. If your desire is for credit and glory, you're holding on to terrestrial fruit. That's such good counsel. If you fast and you need people to know that you fast, if you donate money and you need people to know that you donated money. Now, I'm very grateful that people donate money to universities and to good causes, and, and, and I think we're, we should recognize that donation. But if in the heart of the donator, if the whole reason for donating the money was for the recognition you're holding on to terrestrial fruit, and you can't take that to the celestial kingdom. You can't be that kind of person in the celestial kingdom. Remember when Jesus, the only time Jesus ever talks about his atonement after the fact, in section 19, he doesn't even finish the sentence before he draws attention to the Father. He is a celestial being that doesn't need the credit. And that's what this chapter is all about, so good. doing good for the wrong reason. So if we expand that, what other things, what other reasons do Latter-day Saints do good? Why do we do good? Well, one, as he points out in chapter 13, is we want recognition. But Latter-day Saints also do good for other reasons. Like, for example, we do good out of obligation. We do good out of guilt. They pass the list around? Yeah. You don't want to be the guy that doesn't I don't sign want, up? I have to sign up. In other <laughs> words, I'm going to do good out of guilt. Or I'm going to do good out of obligation. Now, the reality is you're doing good, and that's wonderful. But if the reason you're doing good is to avoid the guilt or the obligation that comes with it, you're holding on to terrestrial fruit. You're doing good for a non-celestial reason. I think a lot of people are, have guilt as kind of a motivator because yeah. we kind of feel bad. It's like human oh. nature. But again, how much do you want Heavenly Father to to do good things in your life because he feels guilty? Do you want to guilt <laughs> Heavenly Father good into luck. blessing you? Good luck. That's not the nature of celestial beings. They don't do things out of guilt because that could be taken advantage of and that could lead to imbalance and that's not how God's operate. So we have to do good. We have to learn eventually. If we're on our way to the celestial city, we have to learn to do good for the right reasons. Yeah. And it's not out of obligation. It's not out of guilt. Another thing that I've noticed is, have you ever noticed people will say, well, I'll go to the, I'll go to the service project because I need the blessings. <laughs> I, I've actually said that. I In other blessings. words, I will do good so that I get a reward. <laughs> well, it's this exchange. We live in this exchange yeah. economy. Yeah. I will do good so that God owes me. And then, oh, I'm going to hold that against him. I'm going to put that in my back pocket. And then when I need something, I'm going to pull it out and say, hey, do you remember when I went to the service project, Lord? You owe me. King Benjamin was like, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> you are the unprofitable servant. But sometimes that's our attitude. I will do good so that God owes me and gives me a blessing. Well, then you're doing good for a reward. Yeah. And that's not a celestial attribute. God doesn't do good so that he gets a reward. We can't take that to the celestial kingdom. 
So think about all the reasons we do good in our society and ask yourself, why should I do good? What is the celestial reason for doing good? And it is simply love. I love you. I love him. And I want to please him. And so if someone needs to, if the missionaries need dinner this week, I love him and I want to serve his servants. Celestial beings do things purely out of love, not out of guilt, not out of obligation, not for a reward, not for recognition, simply out of love. Yeah, so verse 9 of chapter 13 to about verse 17, Jesus, in the key phrase is in verse 9, where Jesus says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. And then right before verse 9, Jesus says, that Heavenly Father already knows what you need. And so some of the prophets have talked about this, that real prayer, true prayer, is where I'm tapping into what God will prompt me what to say. And I remember thinking about that one time when I was teaching my children how to pray, and I would prompt them what to say, and then they would repeat the prayer, and then I would tell them what to say next, and that's kind of how I taught my kids to pray when they were little. That's kind of how Heavenly Father works with us. He kind of inspires us, and we say those things, and we're parting the heavens, and we're coming into his presence. And so prayer can be a revelatory experience. And I think that's kind of what Jesus is saying there. At least I invite you to consider that as a possibility. And then, so what does prayer do? Well, John says that that altar of incense, now, from a ritual standpoint, that's where we're standing. We've we've had the first feast of the bread and the wine. We've partaken of the light of the gospel. We've definitely left the area outside of the tabernacle. Now we're approaching the veil from a ritual perspective, where what's there? Well, look what it says in 1920 and 21. It talks about treasures that are in heaven. Uh, The the furnishings in there are going to be all gold. In the Helaman 5 narrative, Nephi and Lehi are standing on a rock, and they're surrounded and circled with fire. They're ritually standing in the Holy of Holies, or in 1 Nephi 1, if you remember that, when Lehi's at the pillar of the rock, or the rock is there, and a pillar of fire comes down, he is coming into God's presence. And so we're preparing to get there. But to really get there, what do you got to do? We'll look at verses 22 through 34. The rest of 13 is kind of how we get there. And it's complete consecration. Look at verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. In verse 24, you can't serve two masters. And then, in case we miss it, in verse 25, he's talking to the 12. And then he says, don't worry about what you eat or what you drink. By the way, ritually, you've just eaten. Or for your body or what you will in duo put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And then he talks about eating, drinking, and being clothed. Read 26 through 34 and start circling clothed, eating, drinking, things. Things is a code word in the Book of Mormon. Things means words. And when we're talking about these things, these words, these sacred words of the temple, the entire Book of Mormon's temple. And when you do these things, verse 32 then the kingdom of God will come to you. And I think, Mike, there's a deeper level here. We often read this as um, Heavenly Father will help take care of you. But I think going back to our discussion about letting go of terrestrial things, I think there is inherent in us a fear of letting go of what we know makes us happy, a lesser happiness. And I think part of what he's saying here is don't be afraid to let go of a lesser happiness. Trust that Heavenly Father has something better in store for you. Do you remember the first time you asked somebody to quit smoking? Yeah. And you put your hand out and they said, can I finish this carton? And you, do you remember holding out your hand? Yeah. Do you remember the look in their eye when they, with fear in their eyes, they're shaking? I can't let it go. This is my life. This is my world. Because they know that that makes them happy. Yes, and it's that fear. Heavenly Father is asking us to trust that there's a greater happiness. Let go of all the things I'm asking you to let go of. Trust that there's a greater happiness. Just like he says, look, I take care of the birds. They don't have a job. I take care of them. Trust that Heavenly Father has a greater happiness for you. Let it go. 
So going back to that concept of pornography, and there is a natural high that comes from those from lust. Lust elicits a drug inside of us, and there is a natural high that comes. Or if you think about the drug industry, there's a reason why there's billions of dollars happening, right. right? And Heavenly Father's simply saying, okay, let it go. Don't worry about that. And trust that there that what I'm I'm offering you is greater than what you're holding on to. I just I think that's another way to read the end of thirteen. If you'll go back over those same verses and read it that way, and ha- hear him say, "Trust that you can let go of a lesser, and I will feed you with the greater." Because he says, "Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these desires, all of these needs, all of your yearning." Remember how he talked about being filled. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all of those yearnings will be filled. All of your happy, you will be happier by obeying Heavenly Father's commandments than by holding on to what you think makes you happy. Excellent. So remember the brother of Jared? The brother of Jared's having an experience at this point. He's going to enter into God's presence. He sees the finger of the Lord, and there is this exchange of information. And well, the beginning of the 14th chapter, we're entering into that point. And so the very first few verses are all about judgment. Are you ready to be a sacral king and queen? Are you ready to be part of the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, to enter into that sacred presence, to be with the gods? Well, you to be a god, you've got to know how to judge. You've got to know how to see, and you've got to know how to judge, and you've got to be filled with all those attributes we've talked about in the beginning of the temple context of this passage. You got to see right. You got to yeah, judge you gotta right. You got to see people clearly. Yeah, that's what God's do. Which is why he says, "Why do you behold the mote that is in your brother's eye and consider not the beam that is in your own?" So, are you clearly seeing other people so that you can judge them because God sees clearly. And I love that idea about going into the presence of the Father by learning to see. In in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is invited to the house of a Pharisee who doesn't do any things that, you know, he doesn't offer to wash his hands, he doesn't give him anything. And then in comes a woman who washes his feet with her tears and wipes him with the hairs of her head and anoints him. And Simon sees it, and there's this beautiful verse that says, when Simon saw it, it, he thought within himself, this man is a sinner, this man isn't a prophet, because he would have known what and who this woman is that toucheth him for she's a sinner. Now, Simon only saw the sin. Jesus then turns to Simon and says, seest thou this woman? It's one of my favorite moments. Seest thou this woman? Or do you only see the sin? Do you see the person? That's what God sees, is the woman not her actions. And I just, that, if you're going to come into the Father's presence, one of the biggest hurdles is how you see other people, how you criticize and condemn and judge because of what you filled your eyes with. Do you see the person? He's told, you know, when... um, Samuel was told to go find, anoint the new king, and he was told it was one of Jesse's sons. And he walks into Jesse's house, and here comes Eliab, who was big and tall and strong. And Samuel says, oh, that's got to be the king. He made a judgment based on his height and his stature. And the Lord says, no, that's not how I see people. I don't see the height of their stature. I don't see the outward. The Lord looketh upon the heart. So if you're going to be a celestial person, you have to learn to see people like the Lord does and look upon the heart. That's one of the biggest obstacles we face in getting to the celestial kingdom. There's a, I love my, one of my favorite verses is in Doctrine and Covenant section 46, verse 15, that just out of, in the middle of this discussion on the gifts of the Spirit, the Lord shows us how he sees people. It's a beautiful verse where he says, the Lord suits his mercies according to the conditions of the children of men. He sees you in the conditions that you're living in. He sees more than just you. He sees the whole circumstance. 
And if you're going to be like Heavenly Father, you have to see people clearly. Bryce, don't you think as being a father, it's really taught you a lot about this? Yes. Yes, because I live with my children long enough that I can see beyond what they did in that moment. I can see intentions. You can can also see see where they're headed, right? I can also see where they're moving. Right. And when they need to be corrected, because I can see them. And that comes with your wisdom. Yeah. Do you remember when you were a little kid and you're like, my mom and dad know everything, right? You remember being that age? Yep. And then you become an adult and you're like, "Ah, there's a lot I really don't know. (laughs) But I think about the wisdom that you have as a parent that you can see where they're headed, you know their tendencies, and then you just expound that, the God's wisdom and mercy, and he wants us to partake of that divine nature. Yeah. So he I, wants us to see people that way. To me, I love the, going back to Third Nephi 14, I love verse 5, you hypocrite, cast out the beam out of your own eye, cast it out of your eye, and then shalt thou see clearly. To me, that's why this is here in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to let go of all the silly beams that prevent you from seeing people clearly. And you have to learn to see as God sees and see them clearly. So when you do, then you approach ritually, you're almost to the Holy of Holies. Now to get in, you have to go through this piece of material called the veil. And so in verse 7, it says, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. There is some early Christian literature that says this. It says, and this is attributed to Jesus. This is not found in the New Testament. But in this early Christian literature, we have Jesus saying, quote, Let him who seeks not cease seeking until he finds. And when he finds, he will be astounded. And having been astounded, he will reign. And having reigned, he will find rest. That's entering the rest of God. Look at that. You seek and you don't stop. And when you find it, you're like the brother of Jared. You're like, what? And then when you're astounded, you're invited to reign. And when you reign, you find the rest of God. I just find that beautiful. So you have this threefold petition as you approach. Now, if you remember Helaman 5, and if you remember 3 Nephi 11, in both cases, the voice spoke Three times, both times, because in both times in 35, 11 and in Helaman five, ritually speaking, it's the God of heaven. It's the God in the Oracle. He is in the Devere and he is speaking the words, the word, the bar. That's what's happening here. And so ritually it's going to be open in verse seven and then verse eight, nine, and 10 are an exchange of messianic symbols. Verse 8, everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Kind of sounds like that early text. And what man is there of you who, if his son will ask bread, that's a messianic symbol, you'll give him a stone. So on one level, yeah, if I'm a father and my my son says I'm hungry, I'm not going to hand him a rock. That's a really good reading. But a sowed reading, a sacred reading would be, These are symbols of Christ, and we're approaching God. We have to know him. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Once again, two messianic symbols. And so the basic reading, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven, which is good, give good gifts to those that ask him? But what we want to do is enter into God's presence. And so Jesus is inviting us to ask, to seek, to knock. Or as in this other text we just quoted, don't stop asking. And I think he's also, sometimes we turn bread into stone. We turn fish into serpents. Sometimes God gives me, God gives me an experience for my good that hurts. And I turn it into a stone because I see ill intent in God. I don't understand why he would give me this negative experience because doesn't God love me? Isn't he supposed to only do good things for me? Do you remember when Abinadi came in and said, you need to repent, and he was harsh to them, and they said, no, you're my enemy, and they burned him. And sometimes we do that with God. We turn the bread into stone. So if you ask, knock, and seek means that you know and understand what God is doing in your life, 
and that you don't turn your bread experiences into stone simply because they were painful. Some of the biggest blessings of my life have been the painful experiences that I went through. And it really was bread. God doesn't give stones. So to see God as the kind of being that gives me stones when I ask for bread, to see God as the kind of being who gives serpents when I ask for fish, you don't see him. You don't know him. You don't understand him. Therefore, you can't enter in and be with him. If you're going to enter in, you need to understand who he is and trust him. I love this verse in 1 Nephi chapter 2. They, meaning Laman Laman and Lemuel, they did murmur because they knew not the dealings of that God who had created them. That's why we murmur, is because we have not learned who God is. We haven't learned to trust him. And so this very end of the Sermon on the Mount is an appeal, do you know me? Do you know who I am? So he even addresses that in verse 21. Not everyone that will say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into my kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name haven't we done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, you never knew me, and I never knew you. I love the New Testament version says, you never knew me. The Book of Mormon version says, I never knew you. And the idea is, you cannot enter into his presence until you have obtained the celestial attributes, and you think like he thinks, and act like he acts. You have to let go of everything that's celestial and terrestrial. And this final invitation once you're right there at the veil, is to let go of all those last little bits of mortality and see God as he is, because you are that way. And if you know him, and if you love him, you are welcomed into his presence. So we go through the gate, 13th and 14th verse, straight is the gate, verse 14, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And so we come into his presence. And so when we're in his presence, now what are we introduced to? Verse 17, we're introduced to a tree. This is 1 Nephi 8. This is the end of the book of Revelation. This is also the creation narrative. We are now in sacred space with the gods. And so the question he asks is, well, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Fruit, tree, just get your pen out and start circling these. We're in the presence of God. Verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will. So to get to enter in, we have to do all these things. But when we're in... Now, ritually, we're at the throne of God, which is established on a rock, the foundation stone. That's verse 24 and 25. A wise man builds his house, and when we say house, we're talking family on a rock, and his fruit, his posterity, they come to Christ, right? We build our house on the rock, and God builds our house. When we build his house, he builds our house. And so from a ritual first Israelite temple perspective, Jesus is speaking to these guys in the New Testament and in the Book of Mormon, and we end on the rock. This is Helaman 5.12. Jesus is the stone. In fact, if you even take the word stone, eben, it's eb, ben, father, son. Jesus is the father and the son. He is the stone. We're in his presence. He takes us to the father. And it doesn't say this in the Book of Mormon, but I have to read this because it's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount narrative. And it's the end of chapter 7. And here it is, verse 28 and 29 of Matthew 7. It came to pass when Jesus ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught as one having power. The Greek word is actual power and not as the scribes. Jesus is speaking temple speak. And he's saying, do you want to enter into God's presence? This is the way. This is the way you do it. 
And my testimony here is this was given to the Nephites because it has clearly it has application, but also ritually they're in that space. They're in his presence. And my testimony is the Book of Mormon is all about temple. It's all about coming home to Heavenly Father. And Jesus takes us there. And I want to add, I, you know, I love this story about the wise man builds his house upon the rock, but we miss the precursing statement that came before that. That is to illustrate a point, and the point is, whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, will I liken unto the wise men. In other words, you are built upon the rock if you do the things he's just talked about. So at the very end of this sermon, he ends with an invitation. Okay, I've taught. I've given you an expectation. Now, are you going to walk away from this discussion and start to let go of the terrestrial fruit that you're holding on to? That's how you build upon the rock, by doing the things he's taught you to do. Otherwise, you're a man whose house has no rock. You're not on a rock. And everything that comes, all the winds, everything that comes in our society is going to wash that house away, as we see happening all over the world today, who don't have a rock to stand on. But the only people who have a rock to stand on are those who do the things he has taught. So Mike and I have tried our very best to share with you what the expectation is, what he's taught you to do. Now the question is, what are you going to do? Will you end today with one less hand around terrestrial fruit? Will you pull that hand out today? And if not now, when? And when are you going to do it? Because if you won't let go of it, that box is going to pull you into a kingdom you may not really want to go to. Let go of the fruit that really doesn't make us happy. And find the fruit that does. Thanks for listening. That was great. We'll see you next time. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.